My name is Katherine Schwab, and I am director of SOCAM and professor of art history and visual culture in the Department of Visual and Performing Arts. This event was made possible thanks to funding and support from SOCAM, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, the Department of Visual and Performing Arts, undergraduate admissions, alumni relations, and the Academic and Career Development Center. In the forthcoming hour, we will hear individually from our four panelists, followed by Q&A from the audience. That's you. There will be time at the end to come up and talk individually with our speakers. It's a wonderful opportunity to exchange email addresses and stay in touch and build your network. This evening, Dean Richard Greenwald is here briefly. There he is. Uh, but unfortunately, he needs to keep moving this evening because of other events. As a result, we will proceed directly to our program. The printed program is on your chair, um, and it provides short bios of each of our speakers. Now, please join me in welcoming back to the campus Diane Rinfret, Clavisa Cavacci, Nicole Fanaro, and Dan Bruno. Nicole is going to lead. Okay. All right. Um, can anybody hear me first? All right. Um, hi, my name is Nicole Fanaro. Um, I graduated in the class of 2017, so I'm not too far removed from you guys. Um, when I was here, I have to say, I actually started off in a completely different major than I graduated in. Um, I started off as a film and television major in the hopes of getting into broadcast journalism. I always knew I wanted to do journalism, something that involved writing um, in any capacity. Um, but I quickly found that that wasn't for me. Um, and I changed briefly to English journalism and then found that communication major with a journalism minor was the path for me because I liked the balance of having the theory of communication and then the practical components of journalism. Um, in that time, I have to say, like, I really didn't do anything besides work hard. Um, I worked on the student newspaper in several capacities. I did not have a flashy internship. I worked at uh, the marketing communication department here on campus. Um, so all of my internship experience was right here on this campus. I never left. Um, but what I did do is keep writing, and I tried my best to just find as many outlets as I could to keep doing that whether it was writing or copy editing, um, whatever it was, I just tried to take advantage of that opportunity and use it to the best of my abilities to get to do what I wanted to do, which, like I said, was always just to write. Um, so I graduated in 2017, and then I waited. I waited for four months to the date from the day I graduated until I got a job offer, which is where I work now at Hearst Connecticut Media Group. Um, for those of you who don't know, Hearst, Connecticut owns eight daily newspapers in the state of Connecticut, including the Connecticut Post. Um, you've maybe even seen the weekly newspaper, the Fairfield Citizen, hanging around. Um, we, all, we own all of those properties. Um, what I do currently, I work as an online producer, which means that I handle the social media and digital content for the eight daily newspapers. So I'm online all the time. I handle 16 social media accounts every single day. Um, that's no small task, um, but I work with a really, really great team. And what's interesting about that team is that we are six to seven people deep doing eight daily news sites. Um, I was the youngest person to start on this team, which was really intimidating to start. Everyone was at least five years older than me. And when you're 22 on a team of people that are a lot older than you, um, it's, it's a little bit intimidating. You feel like you have to prove yourself a lot. But there was an advantage to that, and the advantage was that they made me work to their level. Um, they made me step up and see what they saw and gain their experience and learn through their eyes what problems and challenges can occur throughout the day and throughout the week and throughout the industry. Um, and there are a lot of challenges right now in digital journalism specifically. Um, there are a lot of issues with making money, getting social media engagement. Social media is a huge deal, we all know it, it's everywhere. Um, but right now with, with news specifically, you know, getting people to trust you and click you on social media is a huge, huge thing. 
Um, and so having a team that's as experienced as the one that I work with, um, you get to learn a lot about that and how to address those challenges. And we might not kn all know the answers all at once, but you're learning it together and that counts for a lot. Um, so that's a little bit about my experience and I think I'm gonna pass it off. Oh, great. Okay, can, looks like it's finally working. Um, great, thank you so much, Kathy, to the staff, to the dean, and to all of you guys for being here, and I hope some parents I heard. Um, it's always hard to fall after panels because it, it sometimes people are just so good, and I always feel like I regret what I wanted to say, so I wanna change my points. But I'll just get right to it. So my name is Clavisa. When I was at Fairfield University, I studied international studies, politics, and French. I graduated in 2014. I got my master's from Columbia and Sciences Po in 2017, so I still feel like a relatively recent graduate. Currently, I'm working as the program operations specialist at Friendship Ambassadors Foundation, Friendship Ambassadors Friendship Ambassadors Foundation, which is a small nonprofit organization located in Greenwich, Connecticut. We put on different programs from around the world. Currently, I'm working on the Youth Assembly, which is a conference that takes place um, in New York City. In the past, it's been in the United Nations. Now, it's taking place at New York University. It brings together 1,000 people from around the world to learn about sustainable development and engage in projects to uh, support the sustainable development goals of the United Nations throughout the world. So just a little bit about me. I wanna get right uh, to some main points and some thoughts of advice I would have for you guys. So your majors and minors, and I wanna talk about how that connects to your career. When you're here at Fairfield University with your colleagues and with your professors, you learn the basics. You learn how to learn, essentially. Um, your majors will point you in the right direction. So for example, you learn basic knowledge and skills, such as theory, history, methodology, tools. However, after you graduate from Fairfield University, it's up to you to take all of those things and capitalize on them, to build upon them, to continue learning. So the way that you will do that is through getting more certificates, through lifelong learning, through training on your own, through engaging with your field more and more, uh, writing, starting up your own blog. So know that this is just the very, very start, and it's up to you to take it to the next level after you graduate from Fairfield University. Um, while you're at Fairfield, you also learn, learn a lot about your field and how to um, engage in certain issues that are taking place, and you're very lucky to be here during very uh, interesting time, uh, very relevant uh, events that are taking place. But after you graduate from Fairfield, again, you have to continue and stay relevant and engage in your field on your own by networking, by being involved in as much as possible. I want to give just a, a small example of what's taking place in the field of foreign languages and international affairs right now. What's very important is that if you want to get a job in that type of work, um, what's highly valued is field experience. So working in a different country with relief aid, for example, working on gender, uh, gender equality in different parts of the world. Uh, what's also very important about foreign language, especially because I'm brought here by the <laughs> modern languages department, um, is again field experience and immersive experience such as studying abroad. And that's really the best way to learn a foreign language. I wanna talk about uh, some career highlights and some challenges and uh, hopefully give some very quick uh, notes on that. So for me, what has been one of the highlights is exactly that, working out in the field. I was working with the United Nations Kosovo team um, in Kosovo. At some point, I was working in China with Dartmouth College, uh, uh, did a small consultancy in Indonesia, and so that has always been a, a great highlight. And I always encourage you guys to travel if you are given the opportunity to do that. Um, you will be asked when you get your first job to work on new and exciting projects. For example, for me, I'm tasked with engineering the move from the Youth Assembly to different countries, and that's really exciting. So I do encourage you that if you are given the opportunity to work on very new, different hands-on projects, take on, exactly like what my colleague did here, take on those as a great challenge. Um, also, another one of the highlights for me has been the teamwork, the people that I've gotten to work with. I'm very blessed that I work with people who, who are very similar minded. They have uh, very positive goals about how they want to make a difference in the world. So surround yourself with people like that. They can be your colleagues, they can be your friends, your family. Of course, I want to very quickly point out some challenges. When you do graduate and you make that transition from school to, uh, to the workforce, you will find some challenges. Again, as my colleague mentioned, I am no uh, exception there. I went through the same challenges. Um, first, you might not get into the exact industry that you want right away, and that's okay. A lot of people in international affairs will say they want to work in the United Nations or the State Department. So does everybody else. <laughs> 
Um, and that's all right. That's a great goal to have. But be aware that your first job might not be exactly what you want. And that's all right. So you have to be ready for different ideas. You have to be open to different options. For example, working in a different city. Maybe you want to work in New York City, but keep your options open because you never know what's going to come your way. Um, when I was offered the opportunity to work in China, it was just for fall and uh, the winter. I would never turn that down. <laughs> So go for it. Um, you might also, the second challenge is you might find yourself applying for a job and not necessarily getting it. You might be doing everything right from your resume and cover letter point of view. However, um, there's a certain piece that's lacking. And I've spoken to people who have a, a, amazing credentials and they found they fell upon the same problem. And there's a key piece there that's missing, and that's the networking. So networking has to be done, and it has to be genuine. Please ask about the networking during the Q&A, because I'm very rushed, uh, as you can see, trying to get every point in. Um, and my last challenge that I want to warn you about is that you will be asked to go above and beyond. Again, I'm so glad you spoke before me, because you're like my living example <laughs> for all the points that I'm making. Um, at some point, I find myself uh, managing a budget of hundreds of thousands of dollars, negotiating contracts for that much money, um, stage managing a festival for 50 musicians, and I had never done any of this before. No training in the job and no training here at Fairfield University. So that's a good problem to have. Look upon those challenges as something to expand upon, to really build yourself and really capitalize on them. You'll be so happy and proud of yourself when you finally prove what you are capable of. My final concluding thoughts is to, um, throughout all of this, know yourself, know what you want and why, as well as know your limitations. What helps with knowing that is reflecting, reflecting by writing or by discussing with everybody around you. We go to a Jesuit university, and so reflection is a huge part of our values here. Take advantage of it and really use it. Um, and my last piece of advice is to strive to always make a difference regardless of how you make it, whether that could be through journalism, through media, through a foreign language, through working in foreign aid in a different country. Um, I always think about Steve Jobs, who he said to Pepsi executive John Scully to get him to work in Apple. He said, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life, or do you want to come with me and change the world? So between those two options, choose not to sell sugar water, but change the world in your own way, in your own terms. Uh, tie everything you do to your own purpose of being, whether that's your side hustle, whether that's your hobby, and your career. Um, this is what will motivate you through your challenges and through your toughest days. So, so we come full circle to why you are here, why you are doing what you're doing at Fairfield University and beyond. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Diane Rinfrey. Can everyone hear me? Um, I'm a graduate class of 2013 uh, with a communication major and marketing and art history minor. Um, however, when I first started at Fairfield U, I came as, in as an undeclared major. I really didn't know what I wanted to focus in on. Um, you know, I had a passion for more of the creative pieces in life like fashion and arts, and so I just really was unsure when I first started, um, but that led me led me to make the decision to become a communications major because the beauty of the major is that it is so broad and there are really no limitations with the communications major. Um, and then I focused on marketing and art history as my minor. Um, and during my time at uh, Fairfield U, I really took advantage of the proximity we are to New York City and the endless opportunities that there are in New York City. Um, it's a quick train ride away. And so during my junior and senior years, I would choose my courses um, and make it so that I would have at least two days available to commute into the city and back um, to get that real world experience that um, just helps build your resume and um, your character as a whole. And so junior year, senior year, um, I interned at a small PR firm, you know, it wasn't exactly my perfect ideal internship, but it was something that um, opened the doors for me and it, it, you know, helped me learn what else is out there and just like even basic things from how to write an email. Because like, I feel like half the things we do are write emails every single day. Um, so then when I graduated, uh, I still was um, very doubtful because it was 2013, the job market was still very tough. and. Um, you know, sending my resume out the door every single night and hearing crickets back. So I wasn't feeling too hopeful about the future. But um, I, when I graduated, I started an internship at Calvin Klein with the men's buying team. 
And while it wasn't a full-time job, it was something. And it was something that led to one thing that led to the next. And my internship um, lasted that summer. I grew and knew the teams, knew the business, understood um, you know, what, what my role was there. And having that opportunity and making the connections internally with the company um, then led me to a freelance role, which led me to a full-time position. Um, and then I got promoted and then promoted again, and I was there for five years. Um, and you know, while I was there, I, I used the skills that I learned with my major, um, you know, interpersonal communication, organizational skills, um, and applied that to the beginning steps of my career, and that really helped me and grounded myself um, and made myself uh, I feel as a trustworthy uh, individual, and then, um, and then um, what happened was when I was there for five years, you sort of you you make these strong connections, you become a trusted employee, and I think the career success point that I had was they were developing a new program um, within my department called the Modern Mentor Program. And the president of North America, um, Calvin Klein, saw this opportunity to say, hey, let's understand what's happening down here with all the millennials. Um, because we're so high up here, we're in meetings, and you know we're not necessarily part of one another in terms of communication day in and day out. So that's when we were able to partner. And we ended up you know, working with all these cross-functional members um, and creating a upcycled, reusable bag that were, was um, distributed across 150 stores in North America. Um, and then most recently, I transitioned to uh, Tiffany & Company um, as a senior analyst for merchandising, um, where I'm responsible for uh, the, the assortment planning, so life cycle planning. I work with um, the visual merchants, so how we set things up and make things pretty in the stores. Um, and then I also work with the pricing, so there's a little bit of math um, involved. And I think that, I th you know, from my point of view, it's really being able to take advantage of um, how close you are to New York City and the opportunities that are there um, could really just open up doors and create new opportunities. Great. We share a lot of similarities. Um, Hi, uh, I'm Dan Bruno, also graduated in 2013. Um, I was a film and television major. So basically, growing up, I always knew I wanted to be in film and television. That was like my, my passion. Um, and I chose Fairfield because Fairfield's actually an incredible school for film and TV for a few different reasons. Um, first off, the proximity to New York City. So for film and television, it's really only LA or New York. So you know, Fairfield being only an hour away, it was perfect for that. Um, for the technical aspects of the work, um, Fairfield is very hands-on. I had a camera in my hand as a freshman, whereas some people at NYU Tisch don't even touch cameras till senior year, so that's great. And then the third thing is internships. That's kind of the magic word of um, my whole career path is um, internships. And surprisingly, Fairfield, has paved the way in film and entertainment in New York City um, in a lot of ways. So basically for my first two years at Fairfield, I studied more of the technical aspects of film and TV. And by my junior year, um, there was a Fairfield alumni who got me an internship at NBC at The Maury Show, um, which is just as crazy as you'd probably imagine. Um, as an intern, I answered calls for people who wanted to be on the show. So that was um, crazy hearing their stories. And I sat audience members and things like that. So that was a great first experience into the world. By senior year, there was another alumni at Sesame Street. Um, and he got me an internship there as well. So basically, um, you always want to keep in touch with the alumni, connect with people on LinkedIn. Um, both of my internships were from Fairfield alumni. So I basically started at um, Sesame Street the second semester of senior year, which was incredible. Um, polar opposite from the Mari show, as you can imagine. And um, it was great. Even the technical aspects I learned at Fairfield, um, 
allowed me to even edit an episode of Sesame Street while I was there. It was an incredible internship. But uh, as it was drawing to an end, um, everyone's wondering what they're going to do. What you know, a, a lot of business students already have their jobs lined up, but um, for us in communications and media, it's not always like that. So by the end of the year, um, an entry level position opened at Sesame Street, and this was kind of my first, I guess, failure in um, my career path was I thought, yes, this is perfect. I'm ending my internship. I'm a senior. I'm graduating. I've worked in this department for six months. Um, I'm going to apply for this, for this job. Um, I applied. I thought the interview went well, but I, I didn't get the job. And that was kind of, um, like Dan said, you know, we graduate without a job. It's kind of um, stressful. Um, I'm an only child, so my parents were not, they, they weren't expecting me to not have a job by graduation. Um, and I told them I wanted to move to the city and look for another internship, which it's, it's funny to think that, I mean, it's fair to think that, you know, you have a degree, you shouldn't be like striving for an internship after you graduate. But that's my biggest advice for the film and television industry is to get your foot in the door. Um, it's such a small world and people that I work with now, I've worked with at internships in the past. It's like an incredibly small world. So after I graduated, um, it took me a couple months and I got an internship at a small film television distribution company called Cynodyme. Um, they, my job was to design DVDs, which I never thought I would be doing. Um, after I worked there for about a year, I got close with my manager and he got hired as a manager at HBO. Um, we had a great relationship and when his assistant quit, um, he brought me along and I've been at HBO for four years now. So it's kind of a, a weird path to get to HBO, but um, I started there at HBO in their DVD um, design business, which I, again, never thought I would be doing. And it's just the nature of the industry. Um, no one watches DVDs anymore. I was designing them. I wasn't even watching DVDs. Um, but now I'm on their digital department. And who knows where I'll be in two years, three years. Um, now it's subscription-based services, HBO versus Netflix, that we were joking about earlier. Who knows? So basically, my advice um, for all of you guys is um, internships, number one. And don't burn any bridges, because I work with people who I've worked with at my past few jobs. It's a very small industry. Um, yeah, that's, pr that's pretty much it. And, um, how things change in the industry every few years. I would say to roll with that. There's really nothing we can do about how things are changing. Everything's changing very fast in our industry. And um, I think if you find a company that you like working for, um, it's good to get your foot in the door there, even if it's not doing exactly what you think um, you will be doing. Um, because like I said, I didn't think I'd be designing DVDs, but I was happy that I was at HBO, a company that I like what they stand for. I like the content they put out. Um, so yeah, that's just a little bit about me. Um, I, what I would like to do before we turn to the, the open Q&A uh, is you've touched on a couple of things. And because we were trying to move through briskly, now you're thinking of other things. So I'm wondering if um, we might come back to Nicole and then just go down the row again, to Clavisa to Diane and then uh, to Dan. But uh, maybe indicate, describe some si a very specific situation where the networking aspect may have played a helpful role to you. Can you think of something, Nicole? Um, not specifically for me personally, but I can think about it in terms of uh, how me knowing a graduate from last year ended up helping uh, our company and our team. So um, somebody that I worked with on the Mirror staff for three years, uh, was one of my good friends. He graduated last year and he was looking for a job. We had an opening on our team. He texted me. I told him, hey, I think you'd be a really great fit for this. It's, you know, digital content. You're a great writer. I think you should apply. Um, within probably a month or two, he had the job and two stags working on the same team on a team of six or seven people. Um, so that's pretty amazing to have that kind of close network of, you know, I worked with you for three years, 
you felt comfortable enough to text me and ask me if I knew of anything happening and we happened to have an opening. Um, and within a matter of, of weeks, maybe a month, month and a half tops, um, he was added to our team and he's been with us for uh, almost six months now. So just that kind of having that that kind of close bond where, you know, you're on clubs, you're on groups, you're in classrooms. Maybe, you know, you were in a class with a with a junior when you were a freshman or what, what have you. And you, you've developed some sort of bond over whatever you were um, working on or whatever class you're in. Um, maintain that because this is just my example is a very small example of how that works. Um, and, and don't be shy about asking for help. Um, I'm very much guilty of being shy about asking for help. I'm the worst at it. Um, but you have to do it. You have to ask for help and you have to let people know, hey, you know what, I'm looking for a job or I'm looking for an internship and make it known what you're looking for. They may not have specifically that, but they may have something pretty close and it may be something that you end up finding out you really like. So definitely be vocal about it, keep your contacts, and just just make sure you keep lines of communication open and have an open mind with whatever you're met with or presented with. Great, thank you. Clavisa? Definitely, I agree. Networking is so huge, and I'm so glad everybody touched on it. Um, I never believed in networking. I didn't think it worked. And I always thought, well, I'm so good because I have my straight A's. I can do it without networking. And it doesn't work like that. So in my um, career, a lot of things have been due to networking, which I'm very thankful for. At some point, I did an internship with the permanent mission of Albania to the United Nations, which I represented um, a foreign country um, in the United Nations um, discussions and meetings. And that I did through an informational interview. So I literally just sent an email to the mission saying, hi, can I meet with you? I'm very interested in your work. I want to see if you have any opportunities. They invited me to their office, so I met with some of the diplomats, and then I had an internship. Um, and then that opened the door for so many more things, because when you can show that you've worked at an embassy or at a consulate or at a UN mission, like that really says something. And that was done through an in informational interview, so please um, take notes on informational interview as a great way to network. Um, my other job, working in China, the company that hired me for this, I had already worked for them teaching French to American students in France. So. They hired me for like different projects consistently. I was hired by them like three times for short term projects, like a couple months. Um, the way that I got in touch with that company was through the modern languages department here, Dr. Joel Coldfield, who's, who's in charge of the OPS classes. You, some of you might have been in them. Um, I used to be an assistant teacher for French, and then he introduced me to the company, and then they got me hired for to go to France and to go to China. There are other instances where I did get a job, you know, by just cold cut um, applying. Uh, the UN Women job in Kosovo, I got it because of my skills, especially in language and credentials. Um, but it doesn't always work like that. So, in, so it really does make a big uh, difference. Oh, my current job right now, actually. Um, so I started as an intern here at Friendship Ambassadors Foundation, um, and then I became a consultant, and then I became a full-time staff. So you'll find yourself climbing ranks like that all the time. Um, I totally agree with the internship currently. My, like I said, my job is due to that. And on that point, if I may shamelessly uh, just make small advertisement, we are hiring volunteers right now for our big conference in New York University, if you're interested. Great way to network. Um, one other point I want to make on the networking is that it not only helps you get your job, you need to look at networking a lot more than just getting your job. So at my company, with the Youth Assembly, we're constantly looking for getting speakers from different organizations, Council on Foreign Relations, Deloitte, everything. Um, and your, ne your network, your connections, your friends, your colleagues in these different companies are what are going to help you every time you want to build partnerships, every time you want to reach out, when you want to plan events and invite different organizations. So it, the value of networking is a lot more than just getting a job. Great. Diane? So the reason why I have my job today is because of my HR rep six years ago. When I started at Calvin Klein um, in the internship, uh, he was a talent manager. Um, so I developed a really close relationship with him and he wanted to career path me. And um, so when, he, when the internship was over, that's when he said, hey, we have a freelance job opening. I think you would be a really good fit because as you prove yourself and you work with um, people in the industry over say your opportunity is three to five months, that's your, that's your chance to really show that you're, the team you're working with what you can do and where your strong skill set are. And then that leads, for example, HR to know how your skills could better fit spots that they have open in the company. So I'd say my HR rep understood where I was strong at. He suggested 
um, this is, wait, will be a really good fit. Um, and then when a full-time job opened, he said, this will also be a really good fit, and it's full-time, so that's awesome. Um, and then he moved on, and he, he bounced around different companies throughout my time when I stayed at Calvin Klein. Um, and then he ended up starting at Tiffany & Co. two years ago. Um, and at that point in my time, um, you know, I, I grew at Calvin Klein, but I was ready for something uh, perhaps more challenging and maybe in a different industry. And, and he was in a, that different industry. He was in jewelry now. He left sort of the fashion clothing aspect world. Um, and that's when there was a job open for product development. And he said, sure, we, let's, we, we can get you in the door. But, you know, it's, once you're in the door, you have to sell yourself. He's not going to hire you um, just because he knows you. So, yes, networking is important. Holding on to relationships is very important. Um, you always have to be nice no matter how tough someone could be on the other side um, because you never know when, the, when and where they'll end up and if you'll be working with them again. Um, so then when I was able to get an interview at Tiffany & Co. with the product development team, which wasn't really in line with what I was currently doing, I was in buying, um, it was an opportunity. And when I uh, interviewed with the director of product development, she actually said to me, based on your skills, I actually think you'll be better for this other job we have open. Um, and that's actually the current job that I have. So it's, it's sort of to, to listen to people that you know, could understand um, where your skill set is, and they'll help direct you and guide you. Don't think that you have to be the one directing your career path. Um, yeah. Dan? Um, I actually. It was at an event just like this in the media center, an alumni <laughs> event, um, where I, after the, the panel was over, I went to uh, a guy, uh, alumni, and his name was Andrew, who worked at Sesame Street. And um, he was looking for interns, and that's how I got my internship there. Um, and that really was a turning point for me. Um, like I said, when I graduated, I didn't get the job. And it was a little frustrating, but you got to keep that um, inside and, you know, I kept in touch with him um, over the next year or two. Um, not like an annoying amount, but every like five, six months, I would reach out to him and just say, um, hey, how's it going? Uh, how's everything at work? Things like that. Um, see if there's any openings, but also just to keep the contact. Um, when I was applying for HBO, I asked him for a letter of recommendation. And um, I don't know if he would have if I you know, hadn't been following up with him, um, or I hadn't been a good worker, or, you know, just been a, a good intern. Um, and there were six interviews at HBO that I had to go through, and every single one brought up his letter of recommendation, because it had, like, Elmo on it, and it had, like, all this, like, Muppets on it. Um, but it really helped me get in the door at HBO, like, my past internship. And like I said, at my first real-time job, um, my boss left, and when a job opened up, he thought of me and reached out to me for the position. I don't think he would have if um, he didn't think I could handle it or didn't think I would uh, be a good, good fit there. So, um, I mean, the name of the game in film and TV is networking. I wouldn't have a job if it wasn't for all the people that, that helped me and like what everybody said, um, ask for help. Um, that's what we're here to do, and we're gonna keep passing it down. Um, but you need, a degree is not enough, sadly, anymore, where you could send 50 resumes a day um, to like Indeed job postings, and it's gonna be really tough to get a job that way because they're taking interns that they've had, they're taking recommendations. Um, so once you get your foot in the door, you start meeting people and keeping those relationships and um, it'll work out. That's really helpful. Thank you. What I'd like to do now is open it up to you. And so I'm going to be walking around, or maybe some of my seminar students will help me. But we need to make sure that you ask your question into the microphone so that the videotape can pick it up. All right? So um, who would like to ask a question? Hi, my name is Matthew. Um, 
I'm an art history major and I'm a junior. And one thing I've been uh, kind of struggling with is narrating my career goals and aspirations. I have a lot of different interests. So I wanted to ask you guys, what is the best way to kind of do, create an elevator pitch to say, here's what I'm interested in. Um, I have all these uh, ideas and um, possibilities of careers, uh, career paths that I want to follow, but I don't know where to get started and how can I build a network off of that uh, by asking other people and pitching this idea. Yeah. Who would like to field that? I'll start. Um, so I think if I heard the first part of your question right, is kind of narrowing down what it is that you really want to focus on, right? So the thing that I think I always asked myself were, what am I good at and what do I love? And somewhere where those meet is what your purpose is. And I think if you consider those things, you should be able to narrow it down to at least a few things of what you might want to pursue. So for me, I looked at, okay, I really love writing. That's what I love to do. What am, what am I, you know, what am I good at? Maybe it's the same thing, you know? Maybe for me it was, you know, I was good at writing, but I also really loved it. I love telling stories. So, and you put the two of them together, the natural fit for me was to pursue something like journalism, um, where I get that, to me, that's a privilege to be able to tell somebody's story and to be able to do that story justice. Um, so for you, I, I'd say that's probably the, the central question to ask yourself is, what do I love and what am I good at? And somewhere in that should be what your purpose is. Um, in terms of, I think, what was the, the rest of your question was asking, um, you know, sort of how to, the like. The elevator pitch. How to, how to articulate that, I think as long as it comes from the heart, when, when, no matter who you're talking to, people are going to recognize heart. People are always going to recognize heart and hustle. If they see that you work hard and that you're passionate about what you do, I think you could pretty much sell anything, um, especially yourself. Um, the key in that is believing that you're good enough and that you're worthy of it. Um, I don't know if anybody else has anything to add to that, but please do. I mean, I'm talking as a as a young one, so. Yeah, that's always a tough question. Um, the elevator pitch, you know, there are people like much older and they still haven't mastered that. Um, the best, one of my pieces of advice is when you, when you wanna work on the wording and the language of the elevator speech, speech, it has to be very specific and it has to be very direct, very to the point. It has to be two to three sentences. You have to be able to define yourself. For example, hi, I'm a student. I study art history and I'm very interested in working in uh, historical museums, whatever it may be. Um, I would recommend speaking with the career services office here um, because they've helped me so much with things like that, um, with how to edit the writing and the language in your resume as well as in your elevator speech. So that, that, that'll help a lot. And really, a lot of it is just practice. The more you practice, the more you will get it down to exactly what you want. And as you grow older, you will learn more. You will know yourself better. I want to talk about a LinkedIn elevator speech because that's different than like an actual elevator speech. Um, because you did mention how can you use an elevator speech to increase and aggrandize your network. One of the best ways to do that, um, you know, when you send somebody a LinkedIn um, invite, write to them. Don't just write a generic message because those will just get tossed out, especially for people who are very alumni, for example, who are very busy and they get a lot of invites all the time. Write who you are, why it is that you want to meet them, or why you're interested in their work. So actually, a lot of it is about if you make it about them. Then they'll understand, they'll open up, and they'll want to help you. Um, on, a, on that point on LinkedIn, I just want to do a very like a one, two, three uh, way to describe how you can network very concretely on LinkedIn. So go to LinkedIn, type in, um, type in um, somebody from, for example, a company you want to work in, Council on Foreign Relations, HBO, and then on the filter, click Fairfield University. So you'll be able to see everybody who works in that company who's from Fairfield University. That's really cool. Once you find those people, reach out to them to connect to them. Once you connect to them and you explain why you want to connect to them, then make an informational meeting. And that's how you can get somebody who has never heard of you in the world to be in the same room face to face with you and potentially help you. Um, hello, um, my name is Aura and I'm an international studies major. Um, I'm a senior now and um, this question will 
go particularly to you, Clavis. I have heard a lot about you. <laughs> um, so I would like to know what was your first job right after Fairfield? Um, you know, international studies is um, a multidisciplinary uh, field, and there is a lot to do there. <laughs> so how do you kind of narrow down uh, where to go after graduation? Yeah, that's a very tough one. International affairs is just so different, so broad. You have gender equality, sustainable development, uh, and just poverty, and so on, peace and war, and so on and so forth. I don't know what my fir first job is, actually, to be honest, because I've had so many different jobs and consultancies and positions, some long-term, some short-term, uh, that I wouldn't be able to define. I guess my first real big girl job is the one that I'm doing right now, where I'm full-time staff, <laughs> um, grew from being an intern to a consultant to that. Um, I would say what helps a lot, if you want to narrow it down, try different things. What helped me figure out exactly what I wanted to do is being the, exactly these short-term projects that I was on, these internships. You learn whether you want to work in gender or not by just testing it out, putting your foot in the water, I think that's the expression. So use the internship uh, opportunities. Go, just have as many experiences as possible to see if that's to your liking or not. Um, I am a huge proponent of field experience. So if you ever get a chance to do that, that'll help you narrow down like your focus of where you want to work geographically. So you, for international studies, this is very specific to this type of field, but I guess you can apply it to your field as well. Figure out what type of work you want to be in, whether it's like human rights, um, gender, whatever it is. One way you can do that is by doing your research. I can't stress enough how important research of your industry is. Um, look up different companies they may be interested in. What type of work do they do? Look up different job positions that you might be interested in five years down the road, two years down the road. Look up different companies, any position that is open, see what the qualifications are, see what the job description is and ask yourself, would you like to do this? Can you picture yourself doing this at some point? So it's a combination of research, knowing yourself, learning more as you go through life, and then trying out and testing out different things from internships to short-term consultancies to being here at lectures to networking and talking with people to see what their job is and see if you like that. It really is such a big combination of how you get to exactly what it is that you want. And once you do get to exactly where it is th that you want to do, be aware that you might change it. You may want to add to it. You may want to shift a little bit. So it's never said everything is just fluid and constantly changing and be open to that. Hi, my name is Catherine Samanek, and I think I'm kind of on the opposite spectrum here as I'm a prospective student, so I'm graduating high school this year. And I have this question mainly towards Nicole. I see myself in your shoes back when you were starting off, and I'm very interested in the journalism field, and that's kind of what I want to pursue coming here. And I was wondering, in such a time where it's ever-changing in this industry, if you could go back to the beginning of Fairfield University and do anything different, seeing how things are now, what would you do? Well, first of all, um, welcome. And I'm so happy to see a young potential journalist here. That makes me so happy. Would I go back in time? Um, would I handle it differently? Is that the essence of your question? You know what? I can't say I would, and here's why. No matter how volatile journalism is right now. The one thing that I learned here, and I think it's very unique to the Fairfield experience, is seeing journalism as tied to being a service. The one thing I was always taught here was that it's a, you know, there's, always, there's that Jesuit principle of being a man and woman for others, right? And I always, in every single class I took in journalism, that was always sort of the underlying message was that no matter what it is, no matter what people are saying, no matter what, you know, whether it's, it's fake or it's not, it's real, you can't make heads or tails out of it, it's a service. At the end of the day, what you're doing is you are, you're charged with the task of telling an honest story. At the end of the day, that's what you're doing. And if you're doing it right, it's not easy. It's not easy at all. And I think that's a very special thing to want to do. And I wouldn't change it, no matter how difficult it is to sometimes keep my head up throughout the day. And you know, I, I work on social media a lot, and I, we get comments even to a local news outlet saying that your news is fake, that that fire didn't happen. It did happen, number one. We had reporters there, they saw it. Um, but number two, it, it's just, it's realizing that you are part of something bigger. You are part of recording what's going on, whether it's 
like what I do in local news or it's much bigger in the country, it's realizing that you are having a role in telling an honest, large story about a person, an event, something. And I wouldn't change that ever. I, I think it's, it's very easy to look at it right now and be very cynical about it. Um, and sometimes I am, being perfectly honest, sometimes I'm very cynical about it. But if it's what you love and it's what you're passionate about, you're going to find a way to make it work. You're going to find a way to say, you know what, uh, maybe it's not going to be in news, in hard news. Maybe it's, it's going to be talking to really interesting people, like if you're interested in musicians or art. Maybe it's going to be talking to those people and telling their story and not necessarily you know, wanting to write about politics and how the White House is burning down. It's going to be about those things. You're going to find the ways to keep the joy in it and to keep it um, as that service to other people and, and also is something that sparks joy in you because ultimately it's your life and you want it to be meaningful and joyful. So I hope that answers your question um, and hopefully you still decide to write we have time for one or two more questions. We've got one in the back. Here we go. Yeah. Hi, my name is Jo Lee, and I'm a freshman at Fairfield. Um, Diane, this question, I guess, is more pointed towards you. Um, I'm interested in working in the fashion industry after college, and since there's no specific fashion program here, I'm just wondering what steps you recommend I take to get my foot in the door of the industry. Um, it's a great question because I felt the same sort of struggle, but um, I think it's important to, I should say, people like it when they see retail experience, so not just the corporate side, but also the hands-on, like dealing customer facing and having that interaction. Um, I worked at a small luxury uh, boutique retailer um, during high school and then when I didn't, before I had all my internships in the summer and winter, I would go back and work retail. Um, so having the face-to-face -face customer interaction um, really helped boost my resume. Um, and then also um, in uh, taking the train to New York City. Um, and when I started, so I, I touched upon, I started as a PR intern in beauty, which I'm not really a big beauty fan, but it was something. Um, and it was something that got me to understand the outside world or the city world and how it operated, um, what a nine to five or, or eight to nine day looked like. Um, and then after the PR uh, internship, um, I interned at Lucky Magazine, which under Hearst Corporation, which that magazine no longer exists. But um, that, I was an accessories intern and it was it was something. And I think the important piece about it was that I had to be open-minded. I didn't know what really I wanted to do. I just knew that it was something that was fun, looked cool on my resume. I worked with cool people that dressed in really funky outfits. Um, but I got hands-on experience and that's what counts is just building those, um, the different internships. And you know, they last three to five months and between your sophomore year to senior year, you have six semesters of potential internships plus summers. Um, and then when I was working, so to go back to Lucky Magazine, I was an accessories intern in the closet and I was maintaining like the inventory that uh, major fashion houses would send and we would have editorials where we, we would then have to shoot, send out those pieces to the shoot, make sure it got back. So it was very, I guess, manual if you had, but I got to work with really cool pieces. Um, and then it wasn't until after that when I entered at Michael Kors, I was sort of on the opposite side now, and I th thought to myself, okay, I understood this, I wanna understand the, the other side to the business. Um, but it was all still in PR, and I was, I was happy, I wasn't like thrilled. I knew it wasn't what I'd ultimately be passionate about, but it, I just, I kept adding to my resume. Um, and, and, you know, developing relationships with all sorts of people um, in the industry. And then when I um, interned, when I graduated and interned at Calvin Klein um, in the buying uh, role, it wasn't until like the, the HR rep as well as who I interned for was like, she would be a really good fit for this. I've seen her grow and develop over the course of three to five months. Um, 
it's that those are the opportunities that you should take and run with it and um, you know put in the long hours the hard effort um, and have patience too it patience is like my number one um, piece of advice because um, things don't happen overnight they take time um, and be flexible you know I started um, in PR and I'm now in merchandising buying that's this is not where I saw myself five years ago when I graduated so patience and flexibility um, and obviously networking um, thank you so much um, I think given the the time and I want to allow many of you to come up to talk to them individually and if you still have questions of course this is a great opportunity they will stay until about eight ish they have work tomorrow, <laughs> so we've got to be sure they get to bed. But let's give them a big round of applause to thank them. Another very insightful evening. So thanks so much for coming, and come on up. Don't be shy. <laughs>